Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Auspicious Elections Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the electional charts for September of 2019. Uh, joining me today is Lisa Scheim. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Chris. And today's date is Saturday, August 17th, 2019, starting at 8.23 p.m. in Denver, Colorado. And I have no idea what episode of the show is like usual. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. But I do know that it is August of 2019, and so we will be talking about September in this episode. Mm-hmm. Which has lots of good electional charts. I've heard <laughs> September is a little complicated. <laughs> you had a hard time finding charts this month. Yeah, I had to go through two full times just to make sure I hadn't missed anything. Here's the chart for the moment. Yeah. So um, as you can see, Mars is about to depart Leo in just a few hours into Virgo, and that does make all of the mutable rising signs more complicated. In particular, we've been really relying a lot on like Sagittarius rising mm -hmm. um, as being like the best rising sign um, with Sagittarius, uh, with Jupiter in its own sign of Sagittarius in a day chart in the first house. And also stationing direct, yes, station direct this month. It did station direct this month, so that makes it even more positive. However, as you can see, with Sagittarius rising, Mars is about to be in the 10th whole sign house, which you generally do not want to do during a day chart. Right. So as soon as Mars moves into Virgo, uh, Mars is going to be overcoming Jupiter through a superior sign-based square, also known as domination or decimation in the Hellenistic tradition. And that is even more dangerous and problematic in day charts mm -hmm. this month, which is pretty much going to be anytime Sagittarius is rising. Yeah, so it got a little complicated trying to mitigate that, looking for other rising signs. Um, Mercury is in its own sign of Virgo the first half of the month, which is nice. Um, it does make like Gemini and Virgo rising good contenders. Um, the issue with Virgo rising, though, is that Mars is there. And so you can't really reliably keep that a night chart, which you would want to do if Mars is there in the first house until later in the month when the sun is like further away from the um, possible ascendant. Okay. Yeah. So Gemini rising becomes one of the best rising signs of the month, switching off from Sagittarius. Got it. And. Just to do a little bit of re review, yeah. as we usually do at the beginning of the episode for this month, um, is there anything that we learned from doing electional charts so far in August, even though we're recording this surprisingly early this month because we're going to a conference, the NCGR conference in Baltimore at the end of the month, so right. we're trying to get this one in early. Yeah. Uh, so we've only had a half of the month and it's not over yet, but is there anything we've learned since our last episode? I mean, some of it's just like I was really having to avoid Scorpio rising as a rising sign because it would be, um, put Mars in the 10th, kind of like Sagittarius will after this. Mm -hmm. um, and the very first bit of Mars transiting um, Leo, Mars was at least applying to Jupiter, but then more recently it hasn't been. And so, and that has been like some part of the working day that I've had to avoid doing important things. Right. Yeah. Um, it was nice when it was applying for a while. Yeah. I was even using that a little bit right. like here. I guess that was actually more like late July. So that was the end of our last sort of electional period. Yeah. Probably after our last electional episode. Yeah. So that was a nice little window, but then Scorpio Rising just became not so usable. Yeah. The big thing I noticed this month was how I don't know if I already said this last month, if I was already had, had been seeing this last month, which I may have. So I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but just how well the Sagittarius rising charts have been working over the past few weeks mm -hmm. and what a huge difference that has been um, compared to the first half of this year, where uh, especially earlier this year for a long time, it was Sagittarius rising with Jupiter and Sagittarius in the first house. Uh, but it was a night chart, and so mm -hmm. Jupiter was contrary to the sect. So if you go back like a few months, that kind of messes things up. But if you go back a few months with Sagittarius rising, like here in March, with Sag rising, the sun is over in Aries, and so it's below the horizon, so it's a night chart. So mm -hmm. even though Jupiter is in its own sign, it's in the first house, um, it's not afflicted, it's contrary to the sect. and. While we were still using those elections a lot earlier this year, 
um, and they were doing okay, I really noticed the difference over the past couple of months about how effective and how much more those elections pop and mm -hmm. are just really stand out as being successful and um, yeah, it's just generally been going really well. And I realized that was partially a sect thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, recently we also have a related, sort of somewhat related thing, which is Jupiter station direct after a several month period of being retrograde. But even prior to that, I noticed before Jupiter had stationed direct uh, that the day chart sad rising elections were just working out really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Which of course we would expect, but it's nice to see that actually play out. Yeah, well, and it gives you a better idea of sect. And mm -hmm. and some of the comparison I've noticed though is that some of the Pisces rising elections have not been working out as well mm. um, lately. And I think it's for the same reason, but kind of reversed, which is it has to do with sect mm -hmm. and the fact that right now the Pisces rising elections are night shards. Mm, yeah. So let me animate it for, well, that's <laughs> hilariously, that's the electional chart we're using for right now for this episode, but yeah. that's because we used the earlier Sag rising election to record a casual astrology podcast a few hours ago. Right. So now we're using like one of the only other rising signs we can use tonight at like 8.30 at night, which is Pisces rising. Yeah. Anyway, you get Pisces rising with Jupiter ruling the ascendant. It's in Sagittarius. It's in the 10th whole sign house. It's now finally direct after several months retrograde. But with the sun down in the sixth house in Leo, this is a night chart. So mm -hmm. Jupiter is contrary to the sect. And I've really been seeing um, how less effective that is in terms of being able to actualize and accomplish what you attempt to accomplish during those le elections. Mm -hmm. And it made me think back to um, some of the discussion about sect being sort of like political alignment or almost like the planets have two different political teams and that the analogy in this instance actually works really well, that that political analogy seemed like it worked really well in this instance where a benefic like Jupiter, when it's contrary to the sect, is like a politician who means well and wants to accomplish good things, but isn't fully the party in power at that time and therefore is much less able to accomplish or execute their agenda compared to what they would be able to do otherwise if they were part of the party that was in power. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that analogy always works with the other planets like the malefics because there's some sort of reverse analogy that works for the malefics in terms of the malefics being more harmful when they're contrary to the sect right. and more constructive when they're of the sect. So there's almost mm -hmm. like some whole other analogy that needs to be used there. But when it comes to the benefics, I do think the analogy of like being part of the party that is not in power and therefore wanting to affect a positive agenda but being unable to and not having the, I don't want to say strength, but but just the ability to execute one's will as successfully is somehow being curtailed or held back or put in check in a way that's not very good or helpful. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm getting from a lot of these Pisces rising elections that I've been seeing lately. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So Im important sect-related lesson, I guess, is what I've been learning over the past few months just with respect to Jupiter and how important Jupiter's sect can be, um, especially or even when you're making it the ruler of the ascendant, even when well dignified by sign. Mm -hmm, for sure. Mm -hmm. I actually thought while you were talking of uh, another example I noticed in the past month. Okay. Um, it's both an example of stationing planets um, and also the worth of still using outer planets in elections. Um, so I had done, I'm going to like keep some details vague because it's a client example, um, but I had done like a few different- Is this like a politician? No, it's not. <laughs> are, you, are you Donald Trump's electional astrologer? <laughs> I can't say. What do you say? I can't confirm or deny. Okay. okay. Um, I'll take that as a yes. So it was, um, I had given them a few different- chart options to do something and it was like between like june july and august uh, yeah june july and august um and the last one was like mid-month just like a few days ago um and i said when i presented them like that it was like an objectively like good chart i don't have the exact chart in mind but um but that i was concerned because of uranus being very stationary at the time and it hitting their natal 
Uranus by aspect mm. um, that they might not be able to use it, that something might intervene. Um, and I have since seen because of where they live, like some stuff kind of arose in the, the location that they are, that in fact that could have happened. And I don't know yet whether they use the June, July, or August chart because those are the three options. But I had said, even though the July chart isn't like as objectively positive as a standalone chart, that I still might advise using it because the Uranus station might, especially aspecting natal Uranus, might indicate something coming up that might not allow them to use the election. Mm. And that's actually my thing in general about not wanting Uranus prominent in charts. Right. Um, not because people can't deal with like something unexpected, but it might actually interrupt the election itself. Um, anyway, and so I've totally seen that happen. I haven't gotten in touch since to see which chart they in fact used, but that looks like that could have easily been the case if they tried to wait and use the August one um, because of what was going on around their location. So um, that kind of like, yeah, reminded me of why I pay attention to stationing planets and what their specific energies are, even if the rest of the chart is really good. Right. Um, because it will, stationing planets do really more heavily imprint whatever that energy is on that chart itself. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, it was an outer planet and some people like wonder about whether to use like outer planets in charts, especially like in traditions where you're otherwise using some like um, ancient astrological concepts like we do, like in elections, you know, using sect and whatever. Um, but that reminds me of why I do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's a good example. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. I was thinking, I don't know if we discussed this on the last episode already, because part part of it's tricky is like since we're recording this so early in the month compared to usual, there hasn't been as much time that's elapsed. Mm -hmm. But we have had like discussions and observations and other stuff that have come up over the past two weeks. I just don't remember if they were happened long enough ago that we didn't already talk about them in the last episode. But right. going back to the recurring discussion about um the debate about how much to focus on like the standalone electional chart and then make the natal chart secondary versus focus on the natal chart and the electional charts secondary. Mm -hmm. I was really re realizing recently that part of my response to that is I come out of the natal tradition and so my natural tendency and originally was to focus on the natal chart and think that that's more important and focus on the transits. And while I still think that's important, I realized recently that part of my response to that whole debate and any criticisms that are occasionally directed at us by certain parties about focusing too much on the standalone chart, I realized eventually that my part of my actual response and rebuttal to that is that I think it's a mistake to underemphasize, and I think some people underestimate the importance of the standalone electional chart. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that you and I have really grown to see and develop over the course of the past decade or two in my instance. Is just how important, even contrary to your expectations, that the standalone electional chart can be, and that sometimes, especially if you if you pay close attention during the course of the day, the change of the rising signs can be really stark, mm -hmm. and then also the um, planets hitting exact angles at different points or at making exact aspects to angles mm -hmm. can be really stark and really notable in terms of describing the quality of that moment mm -hmm. and describing what's going on and sometimes its future or its success or failure mm -hmm. of something that's initiated at that time. Right. So I've been realizing that I need to develop that more as a rebuttal in order to articulate exactly what we're doing and why it's important and why um, what the sort of pushback in response should be to criticism saying that the natal chart needs to be primary and that too much emphasis is being given to the standalone electional chart. Mm -hmm. And we may have talked a little bit last time, I'm not sure about this, but yeah, I mean, it's super striking. I actually remembered as you were talking another example of that kind of thing I think I told you about, but I don't think I talked here about. Um, one of our, I went to like a social, like a building social, mm -hmm. and um, and I had noted at the time, I don't remember if it was Sag rising or Capricorn rising when it started, but I had noted that like Saturn would be, Capricorn rising would be like primary during the party and that like Saturn would hit the ascendant. And I was like, that doesn't sound like a very fun party. And um, I think it must have started with Sag rising because it was a good party, but like uh, maybe it was late Sag rising. So 
I noted at one particular point, though, during the party, it was like everything was like fun and casual and easy. And then there was like this one point in time where I was talking with these two other people. And all of a sudden, they start talking about how both of their fathers have died. Mm. And I was like, that's that's about, I bet Saturn's hitting the Ascendant right now. And because those are the kind of things you can notice if you're paying attention, right? right. To, you know, when things are hitting angles or even just when different rising signs and their kind of planetary rulerships, those energies are becoming more prominent. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and then we had like a suddenly very serious few minute conversation about how their, both of their fathers had died. And even though like I had just met them and I was like, yep, there's Saturn. <laughs> and then it moved on and then we, you know, went back to lighter stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's something there that we've got to eventually uh, attempt to articulate in terms of their overall philosophy, but also even just tangibly what technically is happening. Because one of the objections that somebody made to this years ago, I think around like 2012, when I wrote a blog post about it, where I noticed at the time just something weird. It was like, uh, I forget the exact example, but it was like um, I got locked out of my websites at one point right. suddenly, and like Saturn was. I looked at the chart at the moment, and Saturn was like right on the ascendant or on the midheaven, the degree of the midheaven or something. Mm -hmm. And then I found out a little while later that my websites had been hacked, and I checked the chart, and like Mars was like right on the ascendant or right on the midheaven or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a blog post about it. And somebody objected and they said, well, if that worked, then that would be the case for everybody because in, in different locations, like certain planets hit angles, you know, at the same time for everybody every day or mm. with some drift, which is true. Um, but I think there was something special in that instance where it happened to be activated by annual perfections, like so that, that sign or um, those two planets were somehow activated for me by annual perfection that year. Mm -hmm. And I thought at the time that that could have been part of the key in terms of the interaction between the standalone chart and the natal chart and why during certain days, maybe the prominence or the bringing to prominence of certain planets could indicate the activation of the moment in which certain things happen. Mm -hmm. And I never like fully figured that out or articulated that, but there's something there that needs to be explored in terms of how this works because there's some sort of balance between how consistently sometimes that happens. Like when we're watching this, of course, across the course of several weeks, and we like mm. keep seeing certain rising signs, like Pisces being kind of weak, for example, recently, or Sagittarius like consistently coinciding with relatively positive or favorable interactions. Mm -hmm. There's something about that that is, on the one hand, seems somewhat consistent and stable and obviously that can be thrown off in different directions if you're having major heavy transits one way or another like if you're having like yeah. a terrible mars transit that day and otherwise having a terrible day that's throwing things off like that sag rising period might not be particularly good at that time or could be mm -hmm. overshadowed by something else mm -hmm. um but there's some kind of balance between that of like the consistency of that that it seems like sometimes when you're paying attention and initiating actions or Avoiding initiating actions under certain signs uh, versus, yeah, just um, some other factor, maybe related to the natal chart or other foundational charts that are allowing for the activation of certain planets that are then important in certain days that might then show up in the electional chart. Because mm -hmm. there's always more than one thing happening at once the chart at the moment and natal stuff and probably other things. Um, right. I mean, but even in more minor ways, you know. I think one cannot argue. I've had a, I've had few instances where like Saturn hit the ascendant and I for a few minutes couldn't get into a website or like an order an online order wouldn't go through or something. Then I tried again a few minutes later and then it was fine. Yeah. So I mean, it still happens even if it's not like particularly like important or notable in the long run. Or another one recently was um, when Aries is rising, Saturn's in the tenth, and mm -hmm. I've noticed um, delays. Yeah. It's in the tenth in a night chart. Right and delays under that rising sign, which I'm sure mm. has to do with Saturn being in the 10th in those instances in a, sure. in a night chart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen some of those. Yeah. Speaking of, we should keep going because it's going to be Aries Before rising. Hit that rising sign. <laughs> It'll probably be pretty soon. How much time do we have? <laughs> I don't know. Oh no, this is, oh no, <laughs> Seven, 16 Pisces rising. Yeah. Anyway, about time to move on either way. I mean, I think those are all of the reflection things that I wanted to touch on. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's a good group. Okay.
Well, let's move on then mm -hmm. to the elections for September. Where do we start? Well, there's a few more things just to know about September. So I started to go into it a little bit with the Mars overcoming Jupiter, um, Gemini rising, becoming, becoming one of the better rising signs. Um, that's not just because Mercury is in its own sign of um, Virgo at that time, but with Gemini rising, Mercury is in its own sign of Virgo in an angular house in the fourth, um, and then applying to Venus in a night chart. And that'll get more prominent as the month goes on. But so there's like two different reasons why Gemini rising becomes better for a while. Okay. Um, Saturn, much to my chagrin, Saturn is slightly earlier by degree than Jupiter now. And oh, I yeah, mentioned that last switches, month. Right? Yeah, I mentioned that last month because I think it happened around um, July 18th. It was a little past mid-month in July that that happened. Yeah. Um, so, um, or maybe I meant August. Anyway, so for September, uh, yeah, it stays that way, which is super annoying because everything applies to Saturn first before Jupiter and they're not very far apart. Right. Um, and so it's really hard sometimes to get something applying to Jupiter or, you know, what have you mm -hmm. instead of Saturn if something is in a sign where it can aspect both of them. Um, speaking of Saturn, it does station direct on September 17th at 14 Capricorn. So that's a good um, thing to note just in terms of, you know, that being a more prominent energetic influence for a few days around that time. Saturn stations when? Direct on September 17th. Yeah, that's really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as argu arguably important, maybe not as important as Jupiter stationing direct this month in mm -hmm. August, if we can get day charts focusing on Saturn. If you, you're doing Saturn elections in, with Saturn and Capricorn, then the fact that it's finally stationing direct is means it's opening up a window of much better Saturn elections. I mean, it will be direct, and therefore it does make Capricorn rising, for instance, better. Um, but conversely, you know, the, actually, the first reason I was mentioning it is because I don't really like to use elections for a few day window around like Saturn stationing because it'll just be so much stronger. Mm, okay. Yep. So, and to then finally, um, but very importantly. Mercury and Venus enter Libra mid-month, and then they both start applying to square Saturn for like most of the rest of the month. Mm -hmm. And that, as you'll see, makes elections super difficult for the second half of the month. Um, we have like a huge jump from like the first half to like the end of the month because of that, because we already have difficulties with the mutable rising signs with the Mars overcoming Jupiter, especially in day charts. And then once we hit mid-month, um, slightly earlier, I think, maybe August 14th, um, Mercury and Venus enter Libra, and then all of a sudden we can't use you know, Mer Mercury ruling the Ascendant in a night chart or, or Venus ruling the Ascendant in a night chart, which like starts ruling out like most of the rising signs. Yeah, okay. So you'd like to use, I mean, Libra rising at least as a day chart. Um, at the end of the month it is. Okay. Yeah, but it isn't yet in the beginning. Well, you put Venus then in the 12th. Okay, so it's not in Libra yet? Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, those are some of the overview things for the month. Okay. Um. So So what rising signs are we going to focus on then? Um, Gemini rising a decent bit and uh, one Pisces, one Libra. Okay. Yep. All right, so the first election of the month um, is going to be September 3rd, around 7.45 p.m., and that's going to be about 20 degrees of Pisces rising. And So just to reiterate for everybody yep. or for those that are first-time listeners, you're going to set your chart in your location you're using your city for September 3rd, around 7.45 p.m. approximately. And then adjust the chart using whatever software you're using, whether it's SolarFire or Astro.com or whatever, until the ascendant is at roughly 20 degrees of Pisces mm -hmm. in your location, in your city, so that you can more or less recreate the chart that you're seeing here. Yeah. Uh, and then if you do that successfully, then you will have more or less recreated the chart, that the electional chart that we have here that we're recommending. Mm -hmm. But you need to just adapt it to your location, and you don't need to do a time zone conversion. Right. Like, don't like subtract like seven hours if you're seven hours off of Denver. But instead, we're setting this for local time, 
So set it for about 7.45 PM and then adjust it and do whatever it takes to adjust it until the ascendant is at about 20 degrees of Pisces. Mm -hmm, exactly. Okay. Um, and a few of these charts, this is why I'm doing a lot of Gemini rising charts, a few of these are trickier in terms of like this one, for instance. The first thing I noted in the write-up is this is really important that this chart needs to be a night chart because otherwise you have Mars angular in the seventh house there. And so that's why I did late Pisces rising. You'll also see that I'm kind of like giving, instead of like the minimum like four charts this month, um, there's a little bit more than that simply so you can choose between some of these because you know, a lot of them are like pluses and minuses ones this month. Uh, there's some, you know, kind of like drawbacks to some of them. Anyway, so this one's Pisces rising with Jupiter in Sagittarius in its own sign in the um, 10th house, just after we talked about that being weaker at night. But nonetheless, it is one of the possible charts at the beginning of September. Okay. Um, so, the, so like I said, um, you need to do um, the sun well below the descendant. So you make sure that it's a night chart so that Mars isn't angular. That will keep it a positive chart. Um, but Pisces will rise quickly. So it's going to be like a, a somewhat narrow time window on this one. Yeah, this is going to be really crucial because mm -hmm. I could see people messing this one up yeah. where if you go any earlier than 20 Pisces rising, because by this point, if the sun is about nine degrees below the de descendant, mm -hmm. with the sun being at 11 degrees of Virgo and the descendant being at like 20 Virgo, the sun is pretty well set and it's pretty much going to be a night chart right. wherever you're at. But if you do it pretty much any earlier than that, you're going to run a risk of making this a day chart, mm -hmm. which would be catastrophic in terms yeah. of electional rules and things that we otherwise would want to avoid. Absolutely. One of which is don't make Mars angular in an angular house in a day chart, which right. it would be if you put it in the seventh house in a day chart. And then secondarily, do not make Mars in a day chart squaring the ruler of the ascendant, mm -hmm. which it would be since it's applying to a square with Jupiter here. Mm -hmm. So you can get around that and mitigate that and make this an acceptable chart by making it a night chart. Yep. But what you're explaining is we just have then kind of a small window of opportunity between about 20 degrees of Pisces rising and 29 Pisces rising in order to then initiate our election. For sure. So it's a quick one and you need to know how to adjust the chart. I would say that if you're new to elections and you're not sure about like how to adjust these on your own for your location or to do it really exactly, please use the Gemini rising charts for this month because those are going to be the safest because you don't need to worry as much about like whether it's going to be a day or, day or night chart. Okay. Yeah. So, but I wanted to give this one as an option for people who are used to that and can do something somewhat quickly during that window, simply because um, not only is it a decent chart overall, it has all of those planets in Virgo um, applying to Jupiter, mm -hmm. and that's kind of nice. But this is also the um, Sun Mercury Kazemi, and I couldn't really get another good rising sign to use that. So, the Sun Mercury exact conjunction in Virgo which Mercury rules, of course, so in the seventh house here. Okay. So anyway, um, those were like two different reasons I wanted to use this one, both because the charts this month are all imperfect, and so I had to pick some of them, but also the Kazemi is nice to use for something. Yeah. And this is early enough in the month where, you know, the Sun, Mercury, and Mars are still applying to Jupiter, and that's nice because that'll be over pretty soon. Right. Yeah, that's good. So the ruler of the seventh is applying to the ruler of the first in this chart, yeah, which we've had some of recently this month, which I've been enjoying <clears throat> just over the past few days where Mercury's in early Leo now that it's finally out of its retrograde period and Mercury is applying to a trine with Jupiter, which has been nice in some of the charts like Sagittarius rising because then the ruler of the first has an application from the ruler of the seventh. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing any sort of like first house, seventh house, exchange between two parties um, that really is helpful in terms of making that go smoothly. Mm -hmm, exactly. When I was looking at this chart, I had like a thought in my head, not that this would be like directly applicable to like most people's situations, but it reminded me of like an artist like signing a contract with like an agent or something because mm -hmm. the seventh house is like much more practical. It's got all those Virgo planets and Mercury is really focal mm -hmm. in, in Virgo, but then, then the first house is like Neptune and Pisces. Right. Um, 
with Jupiter in the 10th. Anyway, so if you need, and this may not be applicable, and it is a general purpose election as well, but like if you're doing something for your career where you need to collaborate with another person, this might be a decent chart for that. As long as you can do something um, within that quick window of late Pisces rising and you do know how to adjust that for yourself. Sure. Yeah, I mean, um, it is an application through a square, so there's some sure. potential for tension between the first house and seventh house parties, but they're both otherwise in their own signs and relatively decent placed, so it could still be fine. It's not necessarily a negative outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that they're configured in any way shows some sort of relationship and some sort of affinity. Mm -hmm. Now the moon in this chart is in Scorpio in the ninth. Now I don't normally use Scorpio moons for many elections, but um, I thought it was acceptable enough for a few reasons. One, because all the charts this month are imperfect, but also because um, this is a night chart and so Mars ruling the moon is a little more constructive than it certainly would be during the day. It also does have reception because by sign it's sextile Mars itself in Virgo, even though by degree it is separating. So it has a couple mitigations to that. Mm -hmm. And it's applying by sextile to Venus in a night chart, which is the best planet in a night chart, which Venus itself is fairly angular as long as you have it around 20 Pisces rising. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, I'm trying to decide. So this is a good chart that's especially and primarily directed to like 10th house matters pertaining to career since the ruler of the ascendants in the 10th house. So career, public reputation, um, other things like that, but also mm -hmm. seventh house things since there's a stellium of planets and therefore such an influence on seven or such an emphasis on seventh house matters mm -hmm. with the Venus, Mercury, Sun, and Mars there. Um, with Mars there, there's the potential for some tensions with the seventh house party or there to be some um, low level conflict or strife. But because it's a night chart, as long as you make sure it's a night chart and that the sun is set before you do the election, it shouldn't be a major deal breaker, but instead just surmountable difficulties. And that's further offset by. The ruler of the seventh being so well placed, and especially by Venus being in a night chart in the seventh house as the most positive planet, mm -hmm. really going to help out the seventh house party and is going to have some cascade effect on helping out the first house party, which is you, the per person initiating the election, because Venus is overcoming Jupiter through a superior sign based square known as decimation or domination. Mm -hmm. And the moon is also applying to Venus. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that the moon is also the ruler of the fifth house and it's applying to Venus. So that almost could tie back into is that why you were saying creative things <laughs> earlier? It wasn't. It's just like another another good reason though. Creative matters um going together or fifth house matters, let's say yeah. going together with seventh house matters. Right. Yeah. Sign with an agent. Yeah. So um So the the Area that you don't want to use this chart for would be 11th house things. So you do want to be careful because while it's a good interpersonal chart overall, it's mostly for good like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, partnership type of things, not so much the larger social sphere. So not for things involving like friends or groups because Saturn is in a night chart in the 11th house, which deals with the larger social sphere. So um, that would be one topic not to use this particular chart for. Right. So it's good for like one-on-one. -on -one first house, seventh house relationships, but not good for groups or alliances or friends because mm -hmm. of Saturn in the 11th and the night chart. Yep. Um, and then also just to reemphasize, it's a very narrow window because Pisces rises or finishes rises, rising very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it starts for us here in Denver, the window of opportunity starts about 745, but um, the ascendant zooms through the latter half of Pisces really quickly and is mm -hmm. finished by 8.07 yeah. p.m. It's just about a 20 minute window. So be careful with that because like I think somebody was like talking about doing a wedding election potentially with oh, yeah. a chart similar to this. Mm -hmm. And we were like, yeah, that might be okay, but the only problem is that the window is so small mm -hmm. that practically speaking, if anything goes wrong or if there are any delays, which sometimes just happens as a matter of doing business almost anywhere with mm -hmm. anything, if there's any sort of delays, it's going to completely throw this chart off yeah. and you absolutely would not want to use the following rising sign, which is then mm -hmm. going to be Aries rising yeah. with Saturn in a night chart in the 10th house. So you kind of screw yeah. yourself if you go too late and if there's a delay, then 
it's like for some things, for some electional things, there's a delay, and then it's like fine, you just don't initiate the thing that time. But it's like yeah. if you schedule the wedding and you have like 200 people that yeah. flew out. <laughs> Yeah. And they're all there waiting for you to get married, and then you can't You'd be just like, like wait, y'all, we have to wait three hours now for tourist rising. <laughs> you call it off? Would you call it off? <laughs> I'd wait for tourist rising. <laughs> oh, you would delay it. You just like find some excuse, like. I mean, I wouldn't put myself in that position, but that's only because I do electional pretty frequently. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah, and I don't want to dwell too long in this one because this is the most narrow window, probably, of all of them. This is the best electional chart you could find all month. No, there's more. <laughs> so. Well, I'm just emphasizing <laughs> that because this is like. This chart is like there's a narrow pathway, a green like path garden pass pathway with flowers that is like narrow and going in between like two lava yeah. fields <laughs> yeah. that are filled with mines <laughs> totally. and like piranhas on either side. I mean, that's pretty vivid, but I would largely agree. <laughs> which is like Aries rising if you go too late and you get Aries rising with Saturn in the 10th house in the night chart. But then on the other side is if you go too early and you start the election prematurely, mm -hmm. either before or at sunset when it's still daytime out, then you end up with a day chart with mm -hmm. Mars in the seventh house in a day chart and overcoming and afflicting the ruler of the ascendant, which is Jupiter, which is just going to be really rough time for seventh house matters as well as for the first house person, which is the one who initiates the action. I agree. That's, so that's why the, I want to talk about the other ones too. The piranhas yeah, on the other side. No, for sure. I mean, and to a large extent, um, that's a lot of what I was dealing with looking through September, which is why I had to look through it twice. There were just a lot of really narrow spots, and it was like hard to find good ones without like lots of caveats like that. Right. I just want to emphasize to people so that they don't, if they choose this, they do this election deliberately and knowing that they have a narrow time window that they must stick with yeah. versus there's other like other elections where the window is much broader where it's yeah. like a 2 hour window where they could put the ascendant anywhere in this in that rising sign and it's going to be fine. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So what's the next election? So the next one, oh and by the way, just one more thing. I put all this stuff in the write up too, but um since the moon is fairly closely applying to Venus there and then we'll you know, so it might be passed in some locations, although it should be fine for lots of places. Um, if it is passed in your location, you can check the day before to see if that's usable around the same time. You will just want to make sure if you do that, if you need to do that, that the moon is at least past um, the aspect with Uranus, because you definitely don't want it applying to Uranus first. So that's just like a backup, like if someone wants to use this and the moon is past Venus. Yeah, I mean that's going to rule this election out for some people because it doesn't pass that until six degrees. So I don't know. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. I mean, here obviously this day would work, but in other places where it's like wildly off, then the day before can possibly work because the moon is past Uranus there. I mean, I can already see some of the questions people are going to have, which is like, what if it's past Uranus but it's applying to Mars? Yeah. And I think that would be fine, especially because there's reception. It's not sure. as ideal as the election that we're going for here yeah. where it's applying to Venus. Agreed. But if it's applying to Mars or if it's applying to the Sun or Mercury, that's probably fine. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Okay, second election. So two days later, September 5th, this is going to be around 11.35 p.m which puts about 15 degrees of Gemini rising on the Ascendant. So this one has um, Mercury ruling the Ascendant and placed in its own sign of Virgo in the fourth whole sign house with Venus in a night chart. And it's applying to a square with Jupiter in Sagittarius in the seventh house. Um, so again, you have like a first house, seventh house application, just like we were talking about in the last one. The moon is in Sagittarius as well in the seventh house, and it's applying closely to a conjunction with Jupiter with reception since Jupiter rules the moon there. Um, if the moon is past Jupiter in your location, since this is a close application, it's fine because even though that's like a nice conjunction there, um, if the moon is slightly past Jupiter, all it's doing is then going on to um, square Venus in a night chart, which is the more positive one in a night chart. And then the moon will be enclosed between the benefics. So that's fine too, if that's the case in your place. Um, let's see, what else? The moon is square Mars, but it is separating and in a night chart. So that helps that things out. The exact time was chosen to configure the ascendant ruler to the ascendant degree and place Jupiter on the descendant. 
So you want the ascendant to be in the middle of Gemini in your location mm -hmm. in order to make Mercury aspect the ascendant and make Jupiter right on the descendant. Mm -hmm. And this is so much safer, like I was saying, the Gemini risings are because you don't have to worry about it if it's a night chart. It definitely is with the sun in the fourth house. Yes, yeah, so that technically you could use pretty much any degree of Gemini rising if you wanted to, but mm -hmm. this is just the most optimal moment because then Mercury and Jupiter are going to be the most angular at this point. Exactly. So this is the most optimal to put them on the um, angles, but you do have a much wider time frame, um, both for any like accidents or delays, and also um, just if you need to do anything that takes more than a few moments. There is a little issue where Mercury is like super close to applying to Jupiter, and there might be some people where it's already going to be separating in possibly in time zones west of us. Mm, yeah, I mean you can check that, um, and the you know the day before might be acceptable. Although then the Moon will be probably applying to square Mars, and so even though it's a night chart, that's not normally what I would want to use. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for most people, this chart will work. Mm -hmm. For some people, Mercury. I mean, even if Mercury is already separating, it's still going to be pretty good. It's just not going to mm -hmm. be as good as for first house, seventh house things as um, this one is. But if you're not right. even doing a seventh house election, it may not matter mm -hmm. because it's still the primary thing that this election is good for is just Gemini rising with Mercury in its own sign mm -hmm. and exaltation in a night chart with Venus and yeah. closely configured to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a good fourth house chart for like home and, mm -hmm. family, home and family and living situation. Uh, this could be a good Mercury election for like writing and communication and research and other things related to Mercury. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, we've already said That's it's a decent seventh house chart seventh with house Jupiter there and the moon applying to Jupiter ideally. Mm -hmm. Not a good chart for Saturn in the ninth in the eighth house, the night chart. Yeah. So things involving collective finances or like banks or loans or taxes, things like that, don't use this chart for. Unfortunately, in our location, I couldn't move the midheaven over into Pisces because I wanted to get Saturn sextile Pisces if possible, but it wasn't possible here. It might be in your location. You wanted to get the midheaven sextile Pisces, and uh, next sextile Saturn. I mean, just in case you know that Saturn was like at all relevant to your thing, because Saturn rules the ninth house of you know um, uh, teaching, learning, higher education, foreign travel, and then the eighth house topics I just mentioned. So you know, if your election involved any of those topics, it would be nice to mitigate Saturn at least a little bit. Saturn is slightly mitigated by being in its own sign, but it's still in a night chart, so not great, and in the eighth house. Yeah, it's not really possible to get the midheaven to make it useful for much of anything. You could no. use an earlier degree of Gemini rising, and at least in our location, the midheaven can be at like 14 Aquarius, so that it would be sextile the moon at Jupiter, Yeah, which essentially serves the same function as putting them right on the descendant mm -hmm. in terms of making them more prominent and pivotal and active in the chart, Right, but it would allow you to I don't know, maybe have a larger time window or. You could do that. I mean, yeah, and it depends on the specifics of what you're doing and how long it'll take you, you know? So if you have something that will take longer, maybe do that. I mean, I chose to make Mercury very angular as well, just because that was the ascendant ruler and it's so strongly placed in its own sign. Yeah. I mean, it's still angular ish with eight Gemini rising. It's just not as angular. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, okay. So that's election number two. Mm -hmm. That is number two. I think that's one of the better ones this month, honestly. Okay, so this is one of the best elections of the month, and mm -hmm. it happens at the early hour, like 11 something at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so then the next one is going to be September 10th. I was going to say nobody can use that for a wedding chart, but then I realized you could go to like <laughs> Vegas or something. You could you go to Vegas. I've done elections for people who went to Vegas and had like midnight weddings. Okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> right. So um, September 10th, five days later, is going to be the next election. So that one is around 10.50 p.m., also a little bit late at night. And this one actually does have eight Gemini rising. I think I did do the... 
midheaven sextile Jupiter in this one. Um, so Mercury is still in its own sign of Virgo in the fourth house. Um, towards mid-month, we have a nice situation where Mercury is getting very close to its conjunction with Venus. And, um, you know, while Mercury is in its own sign, so it's a really nice ascendant ruler applying exactly to a conjunction with the benefic of the sect, which is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. um, even though Venus in Virgo itself isn't like the strongest placement for Venus. But um, let's see, could you pull the chart up again? Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's a nice close applying conjunction. The moon is in mid Aquarius in the ninth house here, and it's applying by sextile to Jupiter. This is the one, it's really close though already, the moon Jupiter. Um, and I had to check a whole bunch of locations just to spot check like what it would look like in different places around the world. And this will work in most places in the US. Um, it won't work in San Francisco. If you ha live on the West Coast in places like Portland or Seattle, um, you can get it, but you'll have to do it right at the beginning of Gemini rising, which will be like slightly earlier you, in your location. You can get what? The moon you can get the moon Jupiter. Jupiter. Yeah. Sextile? Yeah, because it was applying so soon, you know, that that's why I started spot checking more than usual. Um, so you can, um, you can get that in most of the US. It won't work in San Francisco, but some other places on the West Coast, as long as you back it up a little bit in time, like 15 ish minutes earlier and you get the very beginning of Gemini rising, then you can still get the moon Jupiter application. And um, in many other places, it's completely fine. Yeah. It's not just the US. It's anywhere west, no, I, west of Denver. So most yeah. of the US plus the entire rest of the world. The only exception is possibly the west coast of the US and anywhere west of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I checked some other cities around the world and for many places this will work. Um, you know, the drawback is, of course, that this is a night chart and the moon is ruled by Saturn. And so normally I don't do that. But like I said, this month was a little tough. And so, all you know, a lot of the charts have some some things like that. Um, and you can back it up a day if the yes. moon is separating from Jupiter. Yes. I in order been. to make it apply. Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say about that? Um, there, yeah, it was a similar note as the earlier one. Make sure if you do back it up a day, um, that the moon is past Uranus because in early Aquarius it won't be. But, you know, in most places where the, um, actual day of the election, September 10th is an issue, then the moon is actually past Uranus. You just want to double check. Okay. So um, anyway, that's the next one. So, you know, it has like a pro and a con. I mean, the pro is that Mercury is so close now to Venus and that's really nice in a night chart and it's still strong in its own sign of rulership in an angular house. Um, yeah, that's gonna affirm and stabilize some of the other Mercury significations that were so good related to communication that we were talking about in the last chart mm -hmm. and even add more of an artistic or an aesthetic bent, which if useful for you, could swing things more in the direction of using this chart compared to the other one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the ascendant ruler placement better in this one. The the that's the pro. The con, of course, is that the moon is ruled by Saturn in a night chart, even though it is otherwise applying to Jupiter, which is positive. Right. So this is almost not as good of a seventh house chart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, because like the Mars Jupiter square is even is really close it's in this very one. Close, yeah. And then the moon is. And the moon, the moon's in the seventh, applying to Jupiter in the other one, and mm -hmm. Mercury is much more closely applying to Jupiter, so that there's a close aspect between the ruler of the seventh and the first, which this yeah. one has, but separating, so it's not as good. Yeah, but it would be good. It's almost better for the first house party if you if you're not trying to focus on seventh house things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Okay, so that's that one. Um, and don't be afraid, you know, I, I did pick the exact time with this one to put Jupiter approximately sextile them in heaven, but um, since the moon Jupiter application is so close already to exact, really don't be afraid to do it earlier if you need to as soon as Gemini starts rising because the moon will still be applying to Jupiter and that's really that plus Gemini rising are the most important pieces to get. You don't, you don't essentially need the Jupiter sextile them in heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. So if you want to use that, you know, feel free to start right when Gemini starts rising. Okay. Okay. Next one is two days later, September 12th, around 11.42 p.m. And that's going to be about 24 degrees Gemini rising, although I'll have a similar caveat if you want to start earlier. Um, so this one, um, same thing, except the Mercury-Venus conjunction is almost exact in this one. So this is just before it goes exact and then starts separating um, afterwards. The moon is in Pisces in the 10th house. Now this one, um, the moon is unfortunately applying to a sextile with Saturn first before it applies to Jupiter with reception, with Jupiter ruling it. But, um, you know, it is just a sextile. So that's not as harsh as like a square or opposition or something like that. Um, it was the only way I could use this Mercury Venus tight conjunction. Mm -hmm. um, none of the other rising signs would really work for various reasons. So um, the exact time here was chosen to get Mercury and Venus, that conjunction within the vicinity of more angular squaring the ascendant, um, and also to wait until the midheaven was in Pisces. So it would be ruled by Jupiter rather than Saturn in a night chart, because before that the um, midheaven was in Aquarius. Right. So I did wait for that. Um, however, this has a similar caveat to like the first election of the month, which is to say there's not much time left in the rising sign at this point because it's a late degree. So only do it this late if you know you can do something fairly quickly. Um, and it's also maybe if it's something more under your control where you don't necessarily need other parties to cooperate during the electional moment. Mm -hmm. um, Otherwise, feel free to start earlier, you know, with an earlier degree of Gemini rising because that 24 degrees isn't essential. It was just kind of nice for a couple of reasons, but, you know, ultimately you really want to make sure it's Gemini rising. And so if you need a larger time window or think you even might need a larger time window, I would definitely start earlier. Okay. Um, I like this one better for financial matters compared to the second one because the moon in both charts is the ruler of the second house. Mm -hmm. But in this one, it's in Pisces ruled by Jupiter, whereas in the previous one, it was in Aquarius ruled by Saturn. So I think this would be a better chart for financial matters if that's a concern between mm -hmm. these two elections. I agree. Yeah. Um, I almost wasn't going to toss this in, but if you, um, if you know what you're doing, um, and can do something quickly and you know how to adjust things for your rising for, for your location, you could use the very beginning of Virgo rising as well. Um, and that's only because the sun is now late enough through the sign that if you do something at the very beginning of Virgo rising, it will still be a night chart. But I would, you know, the, I put these caveats in the write-up too. Like if you want to be safe, use Gemini rising. Um, because you don't want Mars in a day chart in the first. And sometimes it's not just a matter of the sun hitting the ascendant. Sometimes it starts acting like a day chart a few degrees before, even three or four degrees or so, or even possibly more. Um, and so you don't really want to risk it with Mars right there. Um, so I'm just kind of throwing that in as like an extra 10 cents because then you have that Mercury-Venus conjunction in the first, which is really nice, ruling the first. But only do that if you can do something super quickly and you know how to adjust it so that it's the very beginning of Virgo rising in your location. Yeah. I used an election like this to start writing my book 10 something years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but so the window for this would be really narrow because you would yeah. not want to use anything later than five degrees of Virgo. Yeah. Um, so you want to keep the sun 15 degrees or more from the ascendant, which means your range is basically just between zero and four-ish, maybe five degrees of Virgo rising. But to keep it safe, mm -hmm. I would say between zero to four degrees of Virgo rising. Yeah. And if you do that, then it'll still be a night chart, like at about like five ten. Five ten. Five yeah. five fifteen at the morning. It's mm -hmm. a night chart with the ascendant at two degrees of Virgo and then Mercury's at sixteen and the sun is safely like 18 degrees later at 20 degrees of Virgo rising. Mm -hmm. um, and then Mercury's at 28 and Venus is at also 28. 28. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see why I would have liked to use more Virgo rising charts this month because having Mercury in its own sign in the first is really nice, but um, especially as it's applying to Venus. But that Mars was just really in the way as well as 
the sun not being late enough, you know, for most of the month in order to ensure a night chart. And even this is pretty iffy. Like you really have to be super quick. Yeah, I mean, I think this would be a good chart. You would just if this somehow if there's a delay and it switched to a day chart, that would wreck this chart because yeah. then it would not just be Mars in the first house in a day chart, but then like Mars is opposing the moon and the moon's mm -hmm. sort of applying to it after Saturn. Mars would be overcoming Jupiter very through very close yeah. square, even though it's separating by this chart, which is one of the almost positive things about this chart compared to previous ones is Mars is separating. But if you made this a day chart, that would be much more damaging and detrimental to Jupiter and anything Jupiter is trying to signify in the chart. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, keep this a, a night chart if you do go with Virgo rising, but keeping that ascendant early in Virgo in your location. Mm -hmm. And you can see why some of, so many of these were tricky this month, right? Because um, some of the best rising signs would be make it a completely terrible chart if it switched. Yeah, I mean, and that's what happens sometimes. So it just means the astrologers who are using this are going to have to be more on their toes. Yeah. Than usual. Compared to usual in terms right. of using some of these charts and knowing that if they mess it up, it's going to mess it up badly yeah. compared to other times where if you mess it There's up, it may just be, yeah. yeah, yeah, like mildly messed up. Yeah, no, no <laughs> piranhas and like lava <laughs> on either side of the path. Right, exactly. And that's why I threw in a couple of these variations for people who are a little more advanced with elections. But if you're more beginning with elections, I would say the Gemini rising ones are much safer, and that is the bulk of the elections this month. Um, how many are left? There's just one. Okay. Yeah. So one with a possible question mark variation. Um, I, I noticed that we're only up to like the second. We're still halfway oh, through, yeah. through September at this point. Well, like I mentioned, the second half just isn't usable until the very end. Okay. So we have most of them in the first half of the month, and then we jump to the very end of the month. Okay. So um, last one here is September 29th. So about two weeks later, um, around 7:10 a.m. And that's going to be about eight degrees of Libra rising. Um, it is another one where you're going to have to be careful about making sure, in this case, that it's a day chart. Um, so you do need to make sure that the sun is above the ascendant degree. So this is set for just after sunset. Just after sunrise, yeah. I meant to mention that the last chart we looked at, the moon was full. It was a full moon in Pisces. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, so this one's just after sunrise. So make sure um, sunrise has happened, the sun is above the ascendant degree in your location. Super important because in this case, converse to the some of the other ones where we wanted to make sure it was a night chart for a lot of the month. This one, um, if it stays a night chart before the sun rises, then Saturn will be angular in a night chart and we don't want that. So um, definitely make sure the sun is above the ascendant. But then again, kind of a narrow window. I mean, technically you could use a lot of Libra rising, but it's best to do something right after the sun rises because then Saturn isn't right on the degree-based angles. And we do want to de-emphasize that because Saturn is already somewhat prominent there in an angular house. Um, so anyway, this is Venus ruling the ascendant in its own sign of Libra in the first house. The moon is in Libra as well in the first house there. It's applying first to a sextile with Jupiter and Sagittarius in the third house. And then right after that, it'll apply to a conjunction with Venus with reception, Venus ruling the moon. Um, so that's pretty nice. Venus is still pretty closely sextile Jupiter here, although slightly separating. Um, and then I said the I said the thing about just if you have something that you can do quickly, it might be nice to do it right after the sun um, goes above the ascendant, just so you don't put Saturn like right on the IC and square the ascendant. Yeah, or or put the ascendant square Saturn. Right. That's yeah. That's what I said. Well, you said, you're talking about the IC. Both of them. Okay. So anyway, um, so that's you can see we kind of had to skip over a lot of the beginning of the planets ingressing into Libra simply because um, they were applying to square Saturn until now. Um, both um, Venus and Mercury in particular, and then the Sun too, once it also joined in Libra. And um, so that was really tough looking through, and I did double check to make sure, but yeah, because we don't, you know, with Libra rising when Venus is still applying to Saturn, then you have the Ascendant ruler applying to square Saturn, and you don't want that. I mean, in this chart, you could also just move the Ascendant forward and the IC, MCIC forward and put Venus right on the Ascendant. Mm -hmm. And then 
that way that stuff's not applying to hit Saturn immediately after you initiate your election, but it's already separating. Yeah. You could do that too as an alternate. Um, it gives you less of Libra rising to work with. Again, similar to a couple of the other charts we've talked about where you just have to be mindful then that it doesn't go into Scorpio rising because then Mars will be ruling the Ascendant right? in a day chart. So this chart reminds me of T.S. Eliot's birth chart who had Libra rising and a Venus-Mercury conjunction and Libra conjunct the Ascendant, uh -huh. award-winning poet. Mm -hmm. So it'd be good for things like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so and this one actually I think is our featured election of the month. Okay. When we did the year ahead. Um, I had a question, you know, about the day before, but it was a little mixed bag because the day before, around the same time, Venus is actually still applying to Jupiter. But then you get like a balsamic moon, and um, you know, the moon will first so it's not waxing yet so it's it's um right before the new moon in libra and then it will have to square saturn before it goes on to jupiter and and um venus and so i could see why the overall chart looked nicer on the 29th it made me wonder a little bit about this being like another usable chart potentially just because then venus is ruling the ascendant sun and moon and applying to jupiter yeah i mean i think that's totally usable especially Something like closing something down or ending something on a positive note mm, would be yeah. my keyword for this chart for what it would be most well suited for. Yeah. Uh, since we have the waning, the moon at the very end of its cycle, and then so it's ending or closing something down, but then such a positive Venus Jupiter conjunction with Venus or sextile with Venus applying to sextile Jupiter in the third house of communication and just the idea of communicating something positively while bringing something to an end or to completion. Mm hmm. Yeah, that could be good for sure. So yeah, I mean, I just noticed that that was still applying the day before, even though it wasn't quite the new moon yet. Okay. Well, maybe we should throw that in as a alter alternate mm -hmm. to have in the PDFs and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, um, kind of to summarize, um, well, actually, what would the, this be not good for? This would be not good for partnership matters with Mars ruling the seventh house of partnership in a day chart, particularly placed in the 12th. Of people working against your aims. Right. So I wouldn't use this one for partnership. A lot of the other ones were better for that. Yeah. Or problem with enemies, or mm -hmm. as the great Patrick Watson put it recently, I think he said the 12th is the place of haters. Yeah, haters. <laughs> right. <laughs> so <laughs> avoid that. Mars is also ruling the second house here. So might not be good for your own personal finances or income. Yeah, and Saturn's in the fourth, but it's in a day chart, so there might mm -hmm. be some surmountable difficulties surrounding fourth house matters pertaining to the home or living situation or family and parents, but even that's being mitigated by Saturn's like direct, it's in its own sign, and it's being overcome by Venus in Libra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, this does bring up a point about, though, that some modern astrologers might object to with Venus applying to a square with Pluto. Yeah, I mean, I think I even had a quasi objection to that when we did the, <laughs> or at least a comment about that when we, you know, we're looking for charts for the whole year. It's just tough because sometimes there are things like that, and yet it's still one of the better charts of the month. Yeah, I mean, it raises that as an issue in terms of what do you do when you see that? Is that mm -hmm. a deal breaker? Is that not a deal breaker? Right, right, for sure. I mean, it depends on, I think as we often talk about, um, it depends on your scale of time. Like what's your time window for doing what you're trying to do and it, and how big or important is it? Is it like a once in a lifetime thing or is it like I need to do something this month? Mm -hmm. You know, because most people for the like really big things plan a little bit further ahead. Not everyone does, but you know, and so if you Generally, if you have something that's bigger to do, like founding a company or, um, you know, getting married or things like that, um, you would wait for, you know, if you maybe even have a three month window, you would find the best chart in that three month window, which might not be this one in this case with Mars ruling the seventh and Venus applying to Pluto, perhaps not a wedding chart. Sure. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm really struck by that. <laughs> really struck by that. So, um, Pluto, Patrick in his like Twitter thread, he left Pluto out of his like planets oh, yeah. delineations. But one of the keywords I came up with was overreact uh -huh. because like overreaction is a classic Pluto thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and you could run into with a Venus Pluto, Venus applying to square with Pluto in this one. 
you could run into tricky interpersonal things. I would say in particular, perhaps involving family members or something like that with Pluto in the fourth house of home and family. Um, <laughs> Been talking too much today. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot today. We recorded other stuff. So um, yeah, I mean, you could run into things like that. And yet, so what's your time scale again? Is it this I mean, two it, weeks? I think it's still fine. I think the answer is still that's fine because obviously yeah. we're recommending the chart. Yeah. Um, the Pluto thing, there's a question of sometimes when it's hitting a first house thing, it can mean you the one initiating the action or you the person has the quality of that planet um, influencing or blending into and contributing as almost a character factor on your part. So the tendency to overreact to something might be a potential drawback or a danger that you could be more liable to do if you use this chart. Mm -hmm. There could also be tensions with some sort of fourth house entity mm -hmm. uh, that come into play, like a family or a parents or, or right. origins or something like that. Yeah. Or even more like mundane things, like you're trying to do something fourth house related and like, you know, it overall goes well, but you run into some sort of like you know, sewer issue in your new home or something. I mean, it's Turns specific. Out but you built it on like an ancient Indian barrel ground right, or something like right. that. Right. I mean, it's like it can be, it can come from a few different sources like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but ultimately, it's like Venus in Libra in its own sign in the first house, angular, direct, otherwise not afflicted by Mars in a day chart. So, I'm going to say not a deal breaker and totally usable. Just be aware mm -hmm. of the potential for some tensions with the fourth house. Yeah. But they, are not necessarily going to be insurmountable, I don't think. For sure. Yeah. And I definitely do, you know, take into account the outer planets, but also the overall state of the whole chart. Right. Yeah. Especially if you want to do like anything basically in the second half of December besides just going down and getting in a bunker and trying to wait it out until yeah. Yeah. October. Yeah. Like I said, what's your time window? Is it the second half of September? Then use one of those. Do you want to go outside <laughs> in the second two weeks of September or right. do you want to stay in your bunker? Yeah. I mean, at least. Venus will be past Saturn, so that'll probably lighten it up a bit, even if it is still kind of applying to Pluto. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, that sounds good. I think that then is the elections for September, and this is now officially like the longest episode of the Electional Astrology Podcast, clocking in in an hour and seven minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I, this is really good, and I think this is a good demonstration overview of how these episodes normally go. So I might put this out on YouTube after this month has expired just as like an example. So for those mm -hmm. who just came across it, this is uh, a standard episode of what we call the Auspicious Elections Podcast, which we release uh, one episode of usually towards the end of each month. And it's a benefit that's only available to patrons of the Astrology Podcast who sign up on our page on Patreon and become um, basically patrons mm -hmm. um, on the five or ten or now twenty five dollar tiers, where they agree to like pledge to help support the astrology podcast and in return get access to bonus episodes like this one, mm -hmm. uh, which is bonus content for patrons that we just release once a month. We also release the Casual Astrology Podcast, which we just recorded an episode of earlier. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you do a whole write up that you put in a document that I post. So there's like a written version of all of the charts that is like a concise, not us doing a long rambly sort of video version. Yeah. If you want the concise version, look through the written report. A written report. We also post a PDF of each chart mm -hmm. that we've recommended. And we also do release just a purely audio version just in case you want to listen to our jokes while driving in the car mm -hmm. and brilliant electional analysis. Yes. So typically episodes are only 45 minutes. This one went long because we talked a lot about like reviewing stuff at the beginning, mm -hmm. but we usually do the first part as a little bit of a review, then we jump right into the elections for the month. Mm -hmm. All right. So people can find out more information about that at theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. And then you can just click the link to Patreon and you'll see all the different tiers on the right hand side of the page. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for listening. Thanks to Lisa for doing this episode. You can be you're available for electional consultations through your website, which is lisashime.com, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, elections and consultations. And how do you spell that again? It's L-E-I-S-A-S-C-H-A-I-M.com. Did you forget? I did forget. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and you can find out more information about the podcast at theastrologypodcast.com. And I think that's it. All so, right. All right. Let's go get some dinner. Sounds good. All right. <laughs> see you next time. Thanks, everyone, Thank for listening. You. And we'll see you next time.